Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Center for Catholic Studies lecture series. Today, the Center for Catholic Studies is pleased and honored to have as our guest this afternoon, Martha Hennessy, who will share with us insights on Dorothy Day and Jesus, exploring the concept of what discipleship means today, including the inspiring Catholic worker movement. After a 30-year career as an occupational therapist, Martha now spends much of her time dedicated to following the examples of her beloved grandmother, Dorothy, and Jesus, serving as a support for those in desperate need, a courageous voice for justice and truth, and an advocate for peace. Martha embodies an audacious gospel witness despite the fact that such actions have led to personal hardship, including time in prison. Real prison. I don't... Danbury. Danbury, right, local, right here. Um, I don't know how you do it. Uh, it's incredible. Um, the Holy Spirit that Martha exudes, I believe, comes from a deep relationship, an authentic relationship with Christ. Her life and work offer us all a luminous illustration of a sincere love for humanity and a challenge to each of us to care for one another, to be prophetic, while also living simply so that others may simply live and dwell in tranquility. Please join me in welcoming Martha to the podium. Martha, come on. Thank you, Matt. Can you hear me okay? You need a little bit louder, okay. How's that? Is that better? Okay. So with all great endeavors, we should always uh, start with a prayer. And what I have here are uh, the mysteries of the Catholic worker. I'm not sure who wrote them up, but let me just share a, a few of them with you. They're designed to go along with the rosary prayer. So we have the mysteries of peace, reconciliation of enemies, regrowth and reconstruction of homes, villages, gardens, farms, and the natural environment, abundance and harmony, the absence of war in the presence of justice, the civilization of love and life. And let me read to you the joyous mysteries. Beauty in the midst of destruction, joy in the midst of sorrow, wisdom in the face of folly, mercy in the face of wrath, and new life in the midst of death. Amen. So what I wanted to share with you today is a little bit of the background of the Catholic Worker Movement. And I'll just be reading you some thoughts that are a combination of my readings and my experience, but also of others who have written. Um, so much has been written by and about Dorothy. Um, I like to call it the Catholic Worker University. There is so much to study. There's such a rich body uh, of knowledge uh, in terms of what Dorothy herself wrote and what others have been writing since then uh, about her. So here is a little bit of um, what I'd like to share with you about the, the concept, the principles, um, the basis of the Catholic Worker Movement. The Catholic Worker Movement is Catholic in inspiration and in practice. It was born in crisis, a response to the Great Depression. It started in May 1933, with the first paper being published on May Day, May 1st, a workers' um, celebration. Dorothy and Peter envisioned the leadership of the Catholic Worker Movement to be daily con communicants attending mass together. Those of us who live and work together really have to be bound together by this foundation. Retreats were also imperative for ongoing spiritual centeredness, especially for those practicing the works of mercy and giving hospitality to the poor. And one of those retreats, infamous retreats, um, was given in the 1940s by uh, Father 
John Hugo, and I got, to, I got an earful from my mother, who was uh, 14 at the time that these retreats were introduced to Dorothy. The movement is not narrowly Catholic, that is, not practicing narrow-mindedness. It is also made up of non-Catholics and non-practicing Catholics. Dorothy was very ecumenical in her times, ahead of the church. She pursued dialogue with leaders of other faiths, and we must embrace all people of goodwill, all who are serving God. We work with anyone who is doing good works in serving God and in serving each other. It is critical to avoid becoming decentered by current secular policies, economics, or social pressures. We must stay humane, stable, focused, and centered as we address these issues. If the work is of God, it cannot be stopped. However, when resisting the injustice and oppression, we must not bring more rancor or contempt or disdain into our own hearts or the hearts of others. We are to find concordances and learn to compromise in ways that lead everyone forward together. We strive to learn how to make the world a place in which it is easier to be good. So these are some of the ideas that Dorothy and Peter um, brought forth for us. And let me just quickly go over some of the basic uh, tenets, uh, the practices. Um, we have the three points of houses of hospitality and agronomic universities and round table discussions. And each of those three components really works in a beautiful way for us to talk about theory, but also to practice. So it's very much a pray, study, and then act. And so I, I think that the Catholic worker model is quite ingenious, and I think it's something that's very desperately needed in these current times in terms of how we cooperate and how we take care of each other. So a little bit more about what Peter said about the movement. The first point is to reach the man in the street with the social teachings of the Catholic Church. The Catholic social teachings are very critical in all of this. And Dorothy herself, for the first five years of her conversion, knew nothing about the Catholic social teachings, very much starting with rerum novarum, the uh, rights of, and dignity of the workers. And it was Peter who introduced uh, Dorothy to the Catholic social teachings. And he, he said that they were in a hermetically sealed box with the clergy sitting on the lid. And it was, it was their job to open that box and let things out, similar to what Pope Francis is doing these days. Another point, to reach the people through the practice of the corporal and spiritual works of mercy at a personal sacrifice, which means voluntary poverty. And again, that term voluntary poverty holds a lot of mystery to it. Um, you know, we are in a culture and a society and an economy where we're all supposed to work very hard to get to the top. Well, Dorothy and Peter gave us a very different example of a race to the bottom, so to speak. Um, similar to what Jesus was showing us, who you hang out with, you know, the most marginalized. And this is essentially what happens at these houses of hospitality, is where we are living and sharing uh, with the least among us. Another point is to build up a lay apostolate through roundtable discussions for the clarification of thought. Similar to what we're doing here today, um, you cannot, um, according to Lenin, I think one of the Catholic workers was quoting him, was uh, the point that you cannot have uh, the, the practice without developing the theory. And so we still, to this day, have Friday night meetings for the clarification of thought with different speakers coming in. And here, of course, in your university setting, it's the same dynamic of bringing in speakers and then uh, having discussions. Part of our wonderful democracy is to be able to have debate and discussion. And of course, the houses of hospitality for the practice of the works of mercy. For myself, I um, really don't feel that I have a leg to stand on to give these kind of talks if I'm not at least trying to do the work um, at these houses because what I've, I've found in my experience, I've been volunteering at Mary House Catholic Worker 
the house where Dorothy lived the last five years of her life and, and died there in the house uh, with my mother, what I found was I was coming up against myself every day. I mean, it, I went there as an experienced mother, um, therapist, wife, um, you know, family member, and having spent a good part of my childhood moving in and out of the worker as well. Visit, we would spend the summers at the Tivoli farm. Um, but what I found when I came back to the work as an adult, it was still a huge challenge for me. I, I, didn't, I didn't feel fully prepared. So doing this kind of work really brings us right up against ourselves um, and our own, what one of my Catholic worker friends said, um, our own internal imperialistic urges. And that would play itself out um, in the clothing room. When I, when I would say to someone, I gave you a coat yesterday, why are you coming back for another coat today? And it's, I had to learn, I had to learn that, well, this particular person could not hold on to a coat for 24 hours. And so the judgmentalism, um, the, cr the criticism, the um, uncertainty, all of that you're faced with when you're living and working uh, in a house of hospitality. And of course, the agronomic universities to found farming communes for the cure of unemployment, to solve the problem of the machine for the restoration of property and the resisting of the servile state, for the building up of the family, the original community, the first unit of society. And I do believe that Peter had a real genius about him. Um, his family uh, lived on the same land in southern France for over a thousand years. So that longevity, that stability, that commitment um, was very clear in, in his voice, in his practice. Um, he died in 1949. I was born in 1955. I did not know Peter at all, but my mother was, was quite close to him. She did a lot of her learning about uh, growing food um, at the side of uh, Peter Morin. And I think another really important point to make about these agronomic universities is that Peter talked about bringing scholars from the city to work on the land and bringing workers from the countryside into the city to become scholars. And so this was very much a breaking down of the class system where everyone can have a more rounded experience you know, as scholars and workers. I think I should share a little bit with you about some of the basic principles of Catholic social teaching. I think it's always uh, of value to keep revisiting those uh, basic tenets that should be guiding us um, in our daily lives, in our work. And let me just name them. Well, essentially, this is God's will. This is not man's ideology in terms of really studying the Catholic social teachings and applying them for our liberation, our human liberation. And so these points that are always of value to me to keep revisiting, the dignity of the human person, all people are sacred. The community and the common good, the human person is both sacred and social when one suffers, we all suffer. And this is, of course, uh, the mystical body of Christ. Our rights and responsibilities, we have a fundamental right to life, food, shelter, health care, education, and employment. And all of this has major implications for what kind of economy and budget that we choose to implement. Option for the poor, the moral test of a society is how it treats its most vulnerable. And that's certainly a lesson that I learned in prison. Who all is in prison? Um, those that we have failed, those that we choose to scapegoat because they cannot play the game the way it's intended to be played. The dignity of work. The economy exists to serve the people, not the other way around. And of course, Peter talked a lot about the machine and uh, the technology that was really robbing people of their vocations of doing work with their hands as human beings with very engaged minds and very engaged spirits and how the mechanization of labor very much took from human dignity with work. 
solidarity, we are called to work globally for justice and care for God's creation, of course, which Pope Francis has really um, spoken to. We are called to protect people and Mother Earth. And here we are in an era of uh, climate collapse, that this, this, this capitalist system is not sustainable in terms of the Earth that we've been given. Um, God's creation really does require uh, participation, collaboration, respect, and of course, the model that we've had for the last 500 years has been one of uh, white supremacy and plunder. And of course, we have benefited from from this way of life, but we have to change it. Um, we have we certainly have the highest standard of living in human history at this point in time, and it has come at a brutal, brutal cost to the rest of the world. <coughs> I'd like to give you a little bit of a chronology of Dorothy's life. And this is um, something that um, we really have to pay attention to her life in terms of its um, in being embedded in specifically in US history, because this is uh, the uniqueness, I think, uh, of her story. Of She was born into empire and living as a Christian she shows us what it was she was up against and what needed um, to be challenged, addressed, and changed. So let me just start with the 19-teens. Um, the, her family had moved to Chicago um, from San Francisco after the earthquake. And she was maybe 12 years old um, when she started telling us the story, and, and this I have gotten both through her stories, my mother's stories, but also through reading, reading about her life as well. And she experienced um, walking through the Chicago's back of the yards where the workers were working under horrific conditions. She very much became aware of that um, in her early teens. She went off to college um, as a 16-year-old, and this is where she really studied um, People like Dickens, Jack London, Sinclair, Louis Sinclair, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky. She was a very av avid reader from very early on in her life. Um, after her family left Chicago, she dropped out of college and followed them um, back to New York City. Um, and this is where she took a job as a journalist, as a 19-year-old journalist. And, and it was there in New York that she was working for uh, newspapers like The Call, The Liberator, The Masses, socialist papers. You know, our history in the United States is very um, illustrious in terms of all of the different movements and the efforts that have been made to bring justice, especially to the workers. And then, of course, in her first jail uh, experience was related to um, protesting um, the suffrage, suffragist cause. The funny thing about Dorothy is she, her first arrest was related to going to Washington, D.C., but she never voted. Um, this is a real idiosyncrasy of her way of thinking um, through the decades, and I'm not sure that I can explain thoroughly what she was up against with that, but you know, she understood that the state, the solutions were not going to come from the state. And so in the 1920s, we had the Gilded Era. We had the robber barons. We had this, this raping of the economy and, and the wealth going into the hands of a very few. She witnessed that. Um, and it was during this uh, decade that she wrote her novel, The Eleventh Virgin, and bought a, a cottage on Staten Island. And this is where she met my grandfather. And this is where my mother was conceived. Um, and that whole part of her life led her into her Catholic uh, baptism. And of course, in the 1930s, um, they started the Catholic worker movement. She wrote the books Houses of Hospitality and From Union Square to Rome. It was Easton, Pennsylvania, 1938, that they purchased their first farm. My mother had great memories of um, getting out of the city. My mother just did not like the city. She wanted to be in the country. And also, um, the Catholic social teachings of the church were now being promulgated in the Catholic Worker newspaper. And 
Let me just give you a little description of the paper. The circulation um, skyrocketed within a matter of five or six years. Um, circulation went up to 190,000 um, issues of the paper. And it was for the purpose of giving hope to the workers and to the homeless. It was the place to reveal the Catholic uh, Church's Catholic social teachings. Um, and it was also a way of opposing communism. I mean, Dorothy understood that the Communist Party was um, attracting workers because of the deep suffering that they were experiencing, the work conditions, but it was atheistic, and she understood that this was not um, feeding some of the basic human needs for spirituality. Uh, even though she was called a communist herself, um, this was something she was working very hard um, to point out what the problems were. She traveled in Arkansas and Tennessee. She was seeing the starving sharecropper families. She sent a telegraph to Eleanor Roosevelt um, describing these conditions of working families. And then the 1940s, um, with the uh, events of World War II, the circulation, Dorothy very obstinately stated that this war was not a just war. Um, very early on, as Hitler was coming into power, she recognized what was happening. Um, there was a, a ship called the SS Bremen out of Germany that came into New York Harbor, and these were the Nazi elites coming to party down in New York City with other elites. And so the Catholic worker was there to picket the SS Bremen and to, and to say, look, this is, this is what this is about. We are about to be enfolded into this horrific, horrific situation. And she recognized it. And then, of course, she also recognized what it meant with the dropping of the bomb. And I would certainly recommend that you all um, make yourselves familiar with her essay, September 1945. And hers was a very lone Catholic voice saying, this is wrong. This is the worst that th these Christians could be doing, creating and dropping this bomb, which, by the way, was just picking up where the Nazis had left off. And she saw all of this. She understood this. And it was in the 1940s that my mother got married at the age of uh, 18 and proceeded to have nine children. I'm number seven of nine kids. And Dorothy, you know, continued to do all the work that she was doing, as well as now having a, a growing family. So you can imagine the, the workload that she carried for all those decades. It was in the 1950s, during the McCarthy era, that she was um, scrutinized by the FBI, considered a communist, because she believed that uh, the teachings of Christ and the gospel teachings of Matthew 25, she called that the the manifesto of the Catholic worker. She believed that um, everyone needed to be taken care of, thus being uh, labeled a communist. And of course, in the 1960s, she visits Cuba. She travels to Rome for the Vatican II Council. Um, she prays for peace, uh, a situation that occurred with regards to the Vietnam War in the 1960s was that one of the folks who was uh, familiar with the community, his name was Roger Laporte, and he self-immolated in front of the UN um, protesting, protesting this horrific war. And we're having the same thing happening today with uh, a young man named Aaron Burnell, I think was his last name. Um, it was during this time that she was you know, at her strongest, intellectually, uh, the writing, she wrote Therese, Loaves and Fishes during that time. And she also played a role in uh, pulling together Pax Christi and Catholic Peace Fellowship, both uh, organizations dedicated to uh, peacemaking. And of course, in the 1970s, she started to slow down. She had cardiac problems starting in 1976, 77. And it's during this time that Mother Teresa visited her um, at Mary House. Um, Pope Paul VI sent her an 80th birthday card. And she spoke, one of her last major speeches was at the Eucharistic Congress in Philadelphia, and this was 1976. And it was August 6th, and the, um, 
the bishops were having a mass for the military chaplaincy. And this is where she said, you know, why aren't you repenting? Uh, do you remember what this date is, August 6th, the bombing of Hiroshima? And she was very um, outraged and full of angst. And it was after that public speech that she went home and began to have uh, cardiac issues, it, breaking her heart, what the, what the US bishops uh, were doing. And of course, her death day, uh, November 29th, 1980, um, at Mary House, my mother was by her side. Um, her gravestone on Staten Island reads, Deo gracious, thanks be to God. And just some points about her um, after she died, some of the uh, things that were happening. In 2000, the cause for her canonization was opened. In 2002, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. And of course, in 2015, it's when Pope Francis uh, mentions four great Americans to the, both houses of Congress. And I would just point out that three out of the four of them were pacifists. So I think it's pretty clear to us what uh, Pope Francis was uh, trying to give us in terms of uh, a message about our ambitions as an empire. So let me just, again, share a little bit about some of these incredible quotes that Dorothy wrote uh, over the years. I've, I've pulled out a selection that I think really speaks to her ideology, her pacifism, her dedication, and her faith. We oppose yet advocate for poverty, and this is a mystery. We want more than a weekly wage. We want God to teach us love. It seems we never do anything good by ourselves. We just get pushed into it. We are surely unprofitable servants. The most radical thing that we can do is to try and find the face of Christ in others. I have been overcome with grief at times and felt my heart like a stone in my breast. It was so heavy, and always I have heard, too, that voice, pray. Christ is disguised under every type of humanity that treads the earth today. He made heaven hinge on the way we act toward him in his disguise of commonplace, frail, ordinary humanity. One has to make an attempt to know God before we can love him and serve him, or try to know the unknowable. The search goes on as long as we live. Failures are inseparable to a work of this kind and necessary for our growth in holiness. We work under the assumption that the vast majority choose good over evil, God over the devil, and this was written in 1939, House of Hospitality. The best thing to do in the cause of our redemption and real freedom is to read the scriptures, then read what the canonized saints have to say. Our manifesto is the Sermon on the Mount, which means that we will try to be peacemakers. We are not talking of passive resistance. Love and prayer are not passive, but a most active, glowing force. Certainly prayer and fasting are needed today, our own work to overcome the spirit of violence in the world. Love is not the starving of whole populations, Gaza. Love is not the bombarding of open cities. Love is not killing. It is the laying down of one's life for one's friend. We cannot keep silent. We have not kept silence in the face of the monstrous injustice of the class war or the race war that goes on side by side with this world war. This is for 1940s, World War II. And the last one, the church is very insistent that we read the Bible, especially the New Testament a love letter from the Holy Spirit to us. So I'll talk to you a little bit about my own uh, personal experience. Um, you know, I, I grew up with my mother and my grandmother. Uh, my father and my grandfather 
were just not part of the family. They didn't step up to their responsibilities for whatever reasons. And so it was Ma and Granny who raised us nine kids. And I have to say that probably every important decision that I've made in my life um, was certainly influenced by what the two of them were saying. Um, they, they spoke always, always about loving kindness, about being aware of the suffering of others. I was made to understand uh, the suffering of others as a child. And of course, Granny was always handing us books to read, um, very, very influential. Uh, I was uh, 25 when she died. And I was telling some funny stories uh, earlier today. I mean, pe people like to hear the, the everyday stories. and. Uh, one that I really um, remember of Dorothy, uh, she, she would come to us in Vermont and, and visit and as frequently as she could. And I remember my mother was in uh, nurse's training. And so Dorothy came and spent four months with us. And boy, was that an eye-opener for me. I mean, Tamar was very um, permissive, very laid back. And Granny made us wash the dishes. So I'll never forget that at age 10, really getting a wake-up call about what it meant to be you know, part of a family and, and helping out. And then, of course, once when I was 16, um, we were helping her at St. Joe's house on First Street, the men's house. And I was there with my sister Mary, who was 20 years old. And Granny just looked at me piercingly, and she said, Martha, you need to be more like Mary. And, you know, she was right. My sister Mary was contemplative. I was just always rushing around doing things. But I can remember the, the sense of great uh, embarrassment and shame of, oh my goodness, I've disappointed her somehow. <laughs> and I'll never forget, you know, that feeling of um, being corrected, you know, on a spiritual level. So that was all part of the uh, experience and influence that I underwent. And of course, you know, when I was a teenager, the Vietnam War was happening. You know, and Dorothy witnessed one war after the next in her lifetime. And as has, what has occurred in my own lifetime now, I'm afraid to say. Um, but it was with the Vietnam War, I was 14, my brother was 20, he was sent to Vietnam. And I can very clearly remember her coming to the house um, both when he left and when he returned um, from Vietnam. And it was a sense of, will I ever get to see my brother again when he walked out the kitchen door? And so this whole question of pacifism was not just on a, a theoretical level. It was on a physical, experiential heart level of, of watching my brother. And then he came back, and he didn't come back the way he went. And so this was brought into our family um, in the late 60s and early 70s. And Dorothy at one point did say to him, do you want to um, apply for conscientious objector status? And he said, no, um, he wanted to go in. And the other lesson that I clearly remember getting from her was respect for the primacy of conscience. You know, Here she was a pacifist. Here she was knowing what this war was about and her grandson was going over to be part of it. And this is what she held, these, um, these, these idiosyncrasies, these um, lack of concordances in life. I mean, this is life. This is what we're faced with um, when people make their own decisions uh, for themselves. And she knew that very clearly, both in each and every one of her grandchildren and how they live their lives and her own daughter, you know, choosing to marry at 18. So these are all very, very critical uh, lessons. Um, but what's been translated um, for me um, into her life's work, I very clearly understood from an early age the social justice aspect of the movement and the community and of her writings. But what, what really made me uncomfortable was her religiosity, her piety. I couldn't put my mind around that. And it, the family ended up leaving the Catholic Church when we were in our teens. And that really broke her heart. Um, so it took me decades to understand what the faith meant to her and how she translated that, how she lived it. 
And so what I have managed to do now in terms of getting in trouble with um, understanding what does it mean if, if we want to call, our, call ourselves you know, disa disciples of Christ in the 21st century, what does that mean? What, the, the, what does that look like? And for me, it meant the bringing on of the torture program in Guantanamo. I was trained as an occupational therapist. I saw those photos coming out of both um, Abu Ghraib and other sites where we were purposefully breaking down the human psyche and the human nervous system. And I just, I was appalled, absolutely appalled. And that was in, that was in 2004. So I got involved with um, a group called Witness Against Torture that came out of Mary House and went down to Washington, D.C. in defense of these Muslims who were being held. Indefinite detention, extraordinary rendition, suspension of habeas corpus rights, the, the use of the Quran to uh, torture the prisoners. Um, and then the next issue, uh, I ended up... Um, I w was arrested in 1979 protesting a Seabrook nuclear power plant. And then my next arrest wasn't until 2007, and this was around the issue of Guantanamo. John Ashcroft telling us that, you know, it's the worst of the worst being brought into Guantanamo. And then the next issue to come along in 2010 or 11, maybe, were the drones. And, you know, the nuclear weapons were one kind of... Uh, weaponry and technology that really crossed a threshold. I really felt that the drones were another one. And, and, and these machines were acting as judge, jury, and executioner, uh, killing even US citizens. And any of the um, footage that I've heard with the coverage of the war in Gaza, a lot of these people are standing on the ground reporting with the sound of drones overhead. And so the drones are being used now extensively in, in warfare. And then, of course, my last experience was with addressing um, the nuclear weapons. And Phil and Dan Berrigan, in 1980, started what's called the Plowshares Movement. And that was the year that Dorothy died, so she had a sense of this other action being taken. And there, there was some controversy about uh, the secrecy and the destruction of property. And I had to work my way through all of that, discerning you know, having one foot in the Catholic worker movement and making a choice to participate in a plowshares action. And we have in the audience here Mark Koval, who has been a lifelong Catholic worker. He's got the Amistad House in New Haven. You should visit him if you can. He and I are co-defendants with the um, Kings Bay uh, plowshares action. And we tried to bring the body of Christ onto this naval base to this place of great, great sin. And so, you know, the ministry there is you, go, you try to um, speak to the military and say, you need to find a different job. This isn't a good job to have. Um, and then we go into the courtroom, the federal court system of this country, and we try to say, this is a violation. These weapons are a violation of um, human rights, international law, Nuremberg principles, um, we're not allowed to give a necessity defense. We're not allowed to give an international law defense. Um, and then the third component is going into the prison system and ministering to those that we find there, creating community there. So all of this has been a very powerful experience and certainly the grounding and the foundation for it for me was uh, growing up in the Catholic worker movement. So. With that, I should save time for question and answer. I just want to say that I am incredibly grateful to all of those who have come before me, this, this cloud of witnesses that we have, um, both in the Catholic worker movement, but also those faithful to the Catholic Church. It's been a great struggle. I, I feel that the Church has very much left many of us, and yet the Church is saying, come back, come back. Well, I think that the Church needs to come back to us in, in many ways, and I'm hoping and praying that um, these things will, will get better, especially in the realm of war making. Thank you.
Let's see if this, okay, great. Thank you again so much. And this is time for questions and answers. So if anybody does have a question, we'll bring the mic down. Um, you just raise your hand and we'll be here. So thank you. Don't be shy. You can ask personal questions too. <laughs> It's tough again, the first one. Yes, great, two in the front, perfect. You had mentioned your family left the Catholic Church for a little while and then it, it took you a while to kind of come around to the religious side of, of Dorothy's way of living. What brought you back and what was that experience like? What brought me back to my baptism? Well, you know, conversions are strange, mysterious things, and I don't know that I can fully explain myself, but I would say that those images of the prisoners being tortured at Abu Ghraib played a role. I would say that um, the experience that I had in 2002, um, when Dorothy was inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame, you know, I gave a three-minute speech about, we were about to invade Iraq, in March of 2003, and I simply said, well, if you want to appreciate who Dorothy Day was, um, you have to pay attention to what she was saying, and that immediately um, polarized the audience, and that gave me a sense of um, what I had stepped into. And two of the inductees were Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Rosalind Carter, and after the induction ceremony was over, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg ran up to me, grabbed my hand, didn't say a word, and then left. What was I to make of that? And then Rosalind Carter comes up and says, thank you for what you said. And then it was pretty apparent to me what the two of them were trying to tell me. You know, here we have a former first lady of this nation and a sitting justice, Supreme Court justice. And what they were saying to me was, I believe, you have a platform, you better use it. Because they couldn't say what I said. And all of this was draw drawing me in. You know, I was working as an occupational therapist, raised our kids, got them through college, and then all of these things just started happening to me. And I went, I didn't set foot in Mary House for 24 years after Dorothy died. And I revisited Mary House and everybody was smoking cigarettes. It was horrible, I hated it. Um, so it's just that it's been a long trajectory. And at one point I had a spiritual director. I was totally, um, intimidated by Mary House. Um, but I had, I did a two month internship at the London Catholic Worker Farm, you know, trying to prepare myself for volunteering at the House of Hospitality. And it was in that setting that, that Scott sent me to a spiritual director, Sister Margaret. And she said, just lay out all the times in your life that you think God was speaking to you. And this whole chronology just fell out of me. I'm beginning with um, sitting in, Granny's lap with my ear on her chest and really for the first time sensing, uh, I think, the presence of God. And then just all of these different events, my high school art teacher, um, just so many different aspects. And once I wrote that down and laid it out and looked at it, I realized this whole business of what it means to be grabbed by the hair of your head by God and, and then dragged. Um, so all of these things just became cumulative. And at one point I did attend one of the Father Hugo retreats. That was in 2008. In January, I said to my mother, I'm going to a Father Hugo retreat. And she looked at me like, you know, she understood them to be what made Dorothy all stern and, and give up anything beautiful. She, she, my mother really resented that. And so I, I said, I'm going to a Father Hugo retreat. And she, she understood that I was undergoing this um, transformation, that I was returning to the church. And she didn't say anything. And then she died in March. And I didn't attend the, the retreat until that summer. So I didn't have a chance to unpack and debrief with her. But this Father Hugo retreat was um, guided by 
uh, Michael Hugo, Father Hugo's nephew. So the moment I realized he was giving it, and the moment he realized I was attending, we both were really scared each other, thinking, oh my God, what are, how, how is this going to play out meeting each other? And it was a beautiful retreat, and it really helped me to st stand more firmly in my faith. But I think it's, you know, the allowing the suffering of others, accepting the suffering of others, is what really drove me um, to a point of saying, I, I can no longer live in this comfort. I, ha I have to um, step out and find out. And it just each, each um, experience brings us deeper and deeper into, into God's grace. Uh, I'm curious how a world of goodness and peace lives alongside of Vladimir Putin and warlords and drug cartels and what appear to be evil actors. Vladimir Putin and Joe Biden. Um, yes, the world has good and has, has evil. Um, but I really like that biblical saying of try and get the log out of your own eye before you talk about the splinter in your neighbor's eye. And that's all I can think about um, with the situation that we're having with these two most recent wars. Um, I've had three trips to Russia. Um, it's very easy to create an enemy a scapegoat, and that seems to be what we like to do in our culture. And we cannot underestimate what Eisenhower warned against with the military industrial complex. And today, what we have is the industry is driving what's happening. Um, you know, for our second Catholic president to say one thing and do another. That's my concern. Um, you know, this approval of sending these weapons. Um, and we're all, we're all going to be Gazans at some point. This is, this is what that leads to. This is what empire leads to, this enslavement. And so, I mean, I, I find it helpful for me to um, understand that the world has good and evil, and to understand that nation states are going to do what they do for their own health, which is the war of the state, and to resist it, to not accept it, to, to speak out against it. Um, one of Dorothy's favorite books was called um, Bread and Wine by Ignacio Salone, and it's a story of someone who, who, who shouts no against a wall of silence with Mussolini coming into power. And so we have to find joy in the resistance and we have to be honest about, you know, what is good, what is evil. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the best that I can express um, from my heart. Um, we have to be concerned with our own bullies and dictators and the support we've given to others around the globe, historically. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Or? Yes, in the back, great. So I'm thinking about justice. And one thing that you said which stood out to me was that those in prison are scapegoats. I may be misquoting you, but is that the basic idea? So my understanding of prison is that you do something that's not right, and then you face your punishment, you gotta go to prison. So how can the people in prison be scapegoats? Well, many of them come from a background, thank you, good question. Uh, many of them come from backgrounds of violence, addiction, poverty. Um, 
and they really don't have the chance that most of us have uh, in our lives. And, and from the perspective of being trained as an occupational therapist, um, I think the statistics tell us that 80% of the prison population are students in special ed whose educational needs were not necessarily met. Um, you know, those with learning differences, those with uh, family issues. Um, you know, I'd rather look at the crimes of uh, the guys who don't get caught, um, the white collar crime, um, what's, what's undergone, um, what our economy has undergone in terms of criminal behavior, um, in terms of uh, the rating of so many of our institutions. Um, and, you know, it, it, does it make us feel better that these people um, are in prison because of poor judgment, um, because of impulsivity? Um, I know the Bureau of Prisons goes through billions of dollars annually um, to have these prisons, and that money really should be spent on uh, child care, early intervention um, care for children, I mean, we just need to look at the picture so differently um, in terms of retribution versus um, uh, reconciliation and rehabilitation. Um, we, it, when you have a system that demands that the profiteering must go on at any cost, and it is a minority that is benefiting uh, from these profits, I, I just recently read something about in the past 40 years, 40 years ago, the United States had maybe 13 billionaires, and now we have, I think the number was 700. So you can understand what's driving all of this. And, you know, people do make mistakes. Um, a lot of the women that I met in Danbury were, um, it, their charges were related to um, addiction and gambling. Gambling is a very big thing. The, where I was kept was a, you know, a, a women's camp. It was minimum security. Um, so those are the people that I met. Um, a lot of them were um, the fall guys for other people in their families or their groups. So many of the women were there because of uh, what their husbands and boyfriends put them up to. Um, so I think we need to take a closer look at uh, who's the bad guy, who's the good guy. And Where's the mercy? Where's the forgiveness? I mean, who did Jesus hang out with? And, and he healed the most vulnerable. So how are we going to heal ourselves, I guess, is the big question. And the prison system, the carceral system right now is incredibly violent, incredibly racist, and there's big money being made. So we need to, we need to change that. Thank you. Great question. Thanks for that answer. Other questions or comments from the audience? Yes, please, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, you talked in the beginning about volunteering at the Mary House and coming face to face with yourself. You said something like that and just realizing how easy it is to judge people. I'm just curious if you could expand a little bit on that experience. Volunteer. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think the term was our own internal imperialistic urges. And, you know, we're only human. And we want to be comfortable. And we want to take care of our own. And when you create an economic system that caters, you know, to the, to the, worst impulses of our nature, um, to selfishness, to, to, to greediness. Um, what we end up with is what's happening in Gaza. Um, you know, I, I think that you, the United States has set the example, um, unfortunately, for what we're seeing happening today. And you know, we, 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 we have to come up against ourselves. I mean, we can only rehabilitate ourselves, and through that, um, 
be of a help to the common good. Um, it's an exercise. It's an exercise just like prayer is an exercise. Um, you put yourself in a place of community that is um, trying to be of service to the, those who are least among us. I mean, that's absolutely Jesus's message. Um, we just went through Holy Thursday where he washed the feet of his apostles. Um, this whole question, I mean, as a child, I can clearly remember in my catechism this um, agony in the garden. It really stuck with me. Um, there he was, fully human, fully divine, struggling with the desire to live um, and still, you know, having to... Uh, I also like to think in terms, you know, as an occupational therapist with this background in neurology, you know, we have our lower brain thinking or function, which is survival at any cost, and then we have our executive um, higher brain thinking, and I think the agony in the garden is a great example of Jesus wrestling with that whole question of, please take this cup from me. Um, so that's what we're facing, even in a house of hospitality where you're handing out food and clothes and towels for showers. Um, this whole question of, well, it's, it's distribution of the goods. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, who's in charge of hoarding these goods? Why are these goods not available to everyone? So that's what we end up thinking about and looking at when we're doing that kind of work. We might have time for maybe one more question, and then Martha's invited to stay afterwards, too, if you're able to stay and, and would like to chat one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And if you're thinking of one last question, we'll, we'll put a little plug in. Next weekend, uh, Professor Hurley and Devin, our, our campus minister, will be going uh, to a conference called Revolution Over the Heart um, on Dorothy Day, and Martha will be speaking there, and uh, Dr. Hurley will be uh, doing a workshop. So if you are interested in attending that, please feel free to see Devin after the workshop, and she could sign you up, and we'll have transportation as well for that. So if you like what you hear today and want to continue that, we do have another opportunity next weekend. Uh, but will, any last final questions from the audience you want to share? Yes, Tom, perfect, great. So I was just wondering, uh, particularly I was thinking about this because you talked about um, your brother going to Vietnam and, um, and Dorothy Day sort of confronting that reality and her, her um, you talked about her sort of uh, understanding of conscience and that people have to make their own decisions. And I was thinking that one of the things that uh, obviously she would have encountered is with her very radical vision in a certain sense on, on covering a whole host of topics, you know, how we deal with the poor, but seeing that in all like war and prison and all this, she would have encountered people who uh, I'm sure who, who agreed with parts of her vision and sort of, okay, I want to help out with the poor, but maybe in parts of it would have said, okay, well, I don't agree with what you're saying about the war or about prisons, you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering if you have any sort of impressions or your own thoughts about sort of how Dorothy uh, sort of saw that, you know, her willingness to sort of accept that, to try to work with people who maybe, you know, might have thought some of the things she was saying or doing were even wrong, or, you know, and not, um, but, but shared parts of her vision and did, you know, wanted that. And I, so, yeah, um, I, any, any thoughts on that, sort of how she dealt with sort of differences mm -hmm. um, in terms of conscience? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think we have to rely on each other to keep each other in check. <laughs> you know, I, I, I heard stories about, you know, she would make a decision and someone would say, oh, I don't know if that's a good idea or not. So as far as you know, having one person dictate everything, we understand what that leads to. Um, and, and Christ and the apostles was, was the example of a, a community in which we really do have to hold each other uh, accountable. Um, and the, the whole question of what's right and what's wrong, what's true and what's false, I mean, that's every day we have to walk through a discernment process in trying to understand what is God's will for us and what is our own 
willfulness that's, that's behind what we say or what we do. Um, I think it's a minute by minute uh, exercise and, and challenge. Um, and luckily there are those among us who have a bit of a better grasp on what we're supposed to be about. I mean, when you think of Martin Luther King Jr., you think of Gandhi, um, all of those great leaders, what is it that they had that um, helps of 